Welcome again to uh, the class today. I'll begin again on chapter 26, Phylogeny and the Tree of Life. Uh, phylogeny is a study of uh, relationships based on shared ancestral history. That's what phylogeny is, shared ancestral history. So we're going to go through and uh, look at uh, how evolutionary biologists construct phylogenetic trees. But before we do that, let's look at this first question. Uh, if an organism A, B, and C belong to the same class, but to different orders, and if organism D, E, and F belong to the same order, but to different families, which of the following pairs of organisms would be expected to show the greatest degree of structural, structural homology? Again, remember, homologous structures have a common ancestry. So which of these, what would you say? Think about that, and, um, but we, since we don't have a lot of time, I'll just go ahead and show you that. Go ahead and uh, figure that out, uh, practice on that. In the meantime, let's just move to phylogenetic trees. So, phylogeny is the evolutionary history of a species or group of related species. If you look at all these creatures here, all of them, what we are saying is there is an ancestor here. Don't ask me who that ancestor was, but there is an ancestor somewhere there. Where that tree begins to branch, that is where the ancestor is. That's a, so that's a, the, the ancestor. And that ancestor has um, several lineages from there, just like uh, from your grandparents came your aunties and your uncles and, and you start diversifying. So from here, you hand uh, the ancestor, one lineage came and produced the geckos, and then the other lineage came and divided and uh, kept on dividing and producing. And now, um, what I can we can say is that uh, when you look at this, these geckos would be considered to be the basal taxon. The, it branches very early in the evolutionary history of this group of organisms. The branch that forms geckos comes out very early. The others are coming out later, much later, much later. And these two are actually quite related because they share a recent common ancestor who was here. And then a snake is more related to an iguana than it is to this, uh, this glass lizard is more related to the iguana than it is to, let's say, the snake, even though it looks like a snake, because you can already tell this and this, they share an ancestor that came from here that's an ancestor that came from here they share these three share from here while to include this you would have to go far back to that ancestor so that's how you use evolutionary trees so concept 26.1 phylogenies show evolutionary relationships when you talk about phylogenies there are two terminologies i want us to define the first one is systematics and the other one is taxonomy. When you talk about systematics, this is a broad term that refers to classification of organisms based on their evolutionary relationships. Okay, it's a very broad category, systematics. And uh, we can do, uh, in fact, even when they talk about systematics in the, in the seminar, they will talk about systematic theology. There is systematic. Uh, syst systematics refers to a broad category, a way of grouping related things. That's what systematics is. While taxonomy is the, the process of organizing those related things in a hierarchical system, saying who, who is where on the hierarchy. So this one is at the bottom, this one comes next, this comes next. That is what is called taxonomy. When you are dealing with the hierarchical systems that you use to classify. But the whole concept of classifying organisms based on their relationship, that is what we refer to as systematics. 
Okay. Now, when you're dealing with the taxonomy, which is a sub-branch of systematics, uh, again, don't, don't uh, again, uh, let me make that clear. Systematics is a bigger branch and taxonomy is one branch coming out of that bigger uh, tree of systematics. So when you're dealing with the, the, the taxonomy, we use Linnaeus method. That was the older method, Linnaean method uh, of binomial nomenclature, which is by means to, uh, to uh, nomia for name. It's a system of naming an organism based an organism based on two names. And we say the first name is the genus, and the second name is the species specific epithet. And we say the genus has to be capitalized, and um, the specific epithet has to be in small letters. So that's what we have said here, that the first letter of the genus is capitalized. First letter of the specific epithet is lowercase. And the entire name, which is a species name, is italicized. And if you are writing by hand, you would underline it. It's the same thing. You either italicized or you underline it. That means it is the scientific name. For example, when I talk about uh, the African leopard, if I talk about, uh, I saw a leopard, I went to a zoo and I saw a leopard. You don't know whether I saw an African leopard or I saw a snow leopard or you don't know what kind of leopard I saw. But when I tell you that I saw Panthera padus, that you can be sure I saw the African leopard. If I say I saw the Panthera unke, then you can tell, oh, he saw the snow leopard. So, but this is a, so this is a binomial nomenclature. Panthera P is capital, and then Padus is small letter. The whole thing is italicized. The genus and the specific epithet make the species name. That method was developed by Carolus Linnaeus. Again, you need to go back and look at Linnea and, uh, Linnea and uh, the other people that influenced Darwin's work. Now, based on that, we can organize taxonomy like this. Animals, when you are dealing with animals, the very first foundation is the domain. So the animals are eukaryotes. And so they are in the domain eukarya. Now there are two other domains, and um, you have uh, domain bacteria and you are domain archaea, but we are not going to deal with that. Since we are dealing with animals now, we will stick within the middle line, the domain uh, eukarya. You come to the kingdom, the kingdom is animalia, and the phylum is codata, the class is mammalia, the order is carnivora, the family is felidae, the genus is panthera, and the specific epithet is pan, uh, padu, pa, pa, panthera pa, is padus, while the species name, the species name is Pandera Padus. So you can do that. If you are dealing with a man, you could say here, you could uh, begin here with the Eukarya, and then you come to Animalia, and you come to Codata. We are also mammals, we are in Mammalia, but instead of the order carnivora, you would put here the primates. And instead of putting Felidae, here you would put hominidae. And then here, genus, homo, and the species sapiens. So our scientific name would be homo sapiens. Okay? So that's how you use the taxonomic key, the, ta the taxonomic tree. Now, phylogenetic trees show evolutionary history of groups of animals. That's what helps us to know which animals are related to who. For example, suppose we construct a small, a truncated version of a, a, a phylogenetic tree of carnivores. Animals, uh, carnivores are in the order carnivora. And uh, we decide, because there are many carnivores, you have hyenas, you have wolves, coyotes, and, and uh, all the other, the, the mongoose and, and uh, bobcat. And so you, you decide to create 
this uh, phylogenetic tree, so phylogenetic tree, which can show which carnivore is related to it. Now you see on this phylogenetic tree, phylogenetic tree, Felide is appearing very early. That is a basal taxon. And then the next lineage breaks into several groups, uh, Mustelide, which gives rise to this, and then uh, the, this is uh, Canide, which gives rise to Canis, and Canis, you have the Canis ratrans, which is the coyote, or Canis lupus, uh, which is the wolf. And if you are to include the dog, it would be Canis lupus familiaris, which is the, the dog, the, the, our own uh, dogs. And so you can tell that the coyote is much closer related to the wolf than it is to the otter or even to the badger or to the leopard. So these phylogenetic trees help you to see relationships, who is closely related to who. So a phylogenetic tree represents a hypothesis about evolutionary relationships. This is not solid science. Phylogenetic trees can change. When I took entomology, the way I studied insects, when I came to start teaching it, they had already moved some groups into another category. And so the, when you are dealing with the phylogeny, you have to expect that the scientists, as they get more information, they will move groups, uh, join more groups, or remove some groups from where they were. So it's a very uh, dynamic science. Each branch point represents a divergence of two species. And so that represents an ancestor of the two groups that come after that branch point. Now, the sister taxa are groups that share an immediate common ancestor. So if I uh, was to look at this, I would say Canis lupus and the Canis latrans are sister taxa because they share an immediate common ancestor, okay? All right, now, so let's, uh, that's a sister taxa. A root and a tree is a tree that includes a branch to represent the last common ancestor of all the taxa in the tree, all the taxa. So if you have a branch that represents all the taxa, if you can, which represents all the taxa of the, of the, in that tree, then you are talking about a root and tree. So in this case, you could say, this would represent our stem, our roots. Uh, so everybody comes from there. So, so that carnivora there would be uh, our beginning point. So basal taxon is a group that diverged early in the history of the group and originates near the common ancestor of the group. So again, if I come here, the leopard is a basal taxon when you are dealing with the carnivora because it then diverges very early and, uh, uh, in, the, in the history of the group. While polytomy is a branch from which more than two groups emerge, more than two groups emerge. I don't know whether we have a polytomy here. No, we don't. Um, but uh, here, here, here we have, here is a polytomy. You see, here you have three groups emerging from that. That, In fact, you see this branch point forms a polytomy, an unresolved pattern. Yeah, so there are more than, there are about more than two groups emerging from that. Now, here, these are B and C, are sister taxa, okay? Now, if you look at this here, G is the basal taxon because G emerges very early. Here is the common ancestor. G emerges very early, so it is a basal taxon. And uh, so you have the sister taxa. Now you know that, you know the basal taxon, and, um, and you know what a polytomy is. Okay. Uh, let me see, we have something else. Let's keep on moving. Concept 26.2. Phylogenies are inferred from morphological and the molecular data. See, Linnaeus used morphological data. You, you take an animal, you count how many feet, uh, legs it has, how much, uh, how many of this does it have, how many of this. These are morphological structures you are looking at. But today, scientists are beginning to get 
attracted to molecular biology. So they are using, instead of relying on molecular taxonomy, they are using data from DNA, looking at gene, the DNA, similarity of the DNA uh, between related groups. And so we are using molecular biology. So phylogeny now relies on a lot of data from genes and biochemistry, although you still need data from morphology. So it's just that morphology is not enough by itself. So you need morphology, you need to get um, uh, biochemistry, you need to get molecular biology, look at how, how what are the DNA sequence and genes, genes which they share together, and you put all that together, and um, you, you would then decide, okay, based on all this, this group is going to be named here. Now, we talked about homology and analogy. We said hom homology, homology is actually uh, based on shared ancestry. Uh, organisms that share uh, or structures that came from a common ancestor are called homologous structures. While analogy is, share, is based on function. So analogy is actually based on function, shared function. For example, the wing of a bird and the wing of an insect, they both have the same function. So they are analogous structures, but they don't come from the same thing. They, therefore, they are not, you cannot use homology. Those are homologous. We looked at the beginning, when we were beginning the, 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 this uh, semester, we looked at the seal, uh, we looked at the tuna, and the penguin, and we said there were very structure, fusiform, body form, and we say, we call that convergent evolution. We said that is because they have to face similar challenges. So that, that form is actually due to convergent evolution. That's a, an analogous. If you are looking at the, the, the analogy deals with function, uh, similar functions, therefore structures can be look similar because they are performing similar function, not because they have a shared ancestry. So convergent evolution produces adaptations in organisms from different evolutionary lineages. I've just mentioned that. Now, I want to go to uh, two concepts that uh, people uh, usually struggle with, and that's the concept of uh, ancestral characters versus derived characters. Ancestral characters versus derived characters. Ancestral character is a trait inherited from an ancestor. So all the members that diverge from that ancestor will have that trait because they got it from the ancestor. So you call that ancestral trait. But as adaptation takes place, a particular group can develop another character that is unique to that group. And so that character was not there in the ancestor, but now it is in the members that arise from that group. And so you call that a derived character. So derived, derived character is a trait that the current organism has, but the previous ones did not. Such as if you look at the limbs in an amphibian and reptiles and birds and uh, mammals, but the limbs, the four limbs, were not there in fish. They don't have them. Even though fish, which uh, evolutionarily, Amphibians and reptiles also share a common ancestor with the fish, but the fish didn't have the limbs. So limbs, when you are dealing with the, with the tetrapods, limbs are a derived character. It's not an ancestral character. But if you are dealing with a, 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 another structure that, that even fish have, and other, like lungs, then you could say lungs are uh, an ancestral character in that case, although we are going to look ahead, ahead and see some other examples. Let's look at this example uh, so that we can work this better. Ancestral and derived characters. Construct a phylogenetic tree of a following group of organisms, uh, of these groups. And so the, here are the characters uh, you should consider. Look at the lungs, jaw, uh, feathers, gizzard, 
and fur, presence of fur. And you consider the following five groups of organisms. Lamprey, um, which is uh, probably a primitive type of a fish. Uh, then um, uh, it's a marine organism anyway. An antelope, think about a deer. A bald eagle, an alligator, or a bass, which is, which is a fish. Now, we are saying, you look at this, the lamprey doesn't have lungs, you know, because it uses gills. It doesn't have jaws, so it's a jawless fish. Uh, it doesn't have feathers, it doesn't have a gizzard, it doesn't have fur. An antelope has lungs and jaw, but no feathers and no gizzard, uh, no gizzard but it has fur. Bald eagle has all this before, and, but has no fur. Alligator has the first two lungs and jaw, no feathers, it has a gizzard, but no fur. And bass has no uh, it has uh, no lungs, but it has jaw, that's fish, and it doesn't have the others. So when you are constructing an evolutionary tree, what you want to do is ask which of these characters is has the fewest members. For example, if you look at the lamprey, the lamprey doesn't have any of this. What means now, if you construct a tree, uh, you would make a branch, I'll show you a branch, you would build like that branch, and then you make a, you, a tree, and then you bring a branch out, and you give that branch, you name lampreys from that branch. Then the other branch, the other branch continues, then you ask yourself, Ah, which one has the fewest here, bus? And what does bus have? The, la the jaws. So you, you now create jaws, you put a jaw somewhere, and then you get a, a branch going to the bus. Then the other branch continues. Then you see, ah, oh, okay, now the antelope uh, has uh, lungs and jaws, doesn't have this. And then you can get a branch going to the antelopes. And then the other two branches, the other, the other one goes and it branches into two, because you only have two remaining. One is the alligator, and the other one is the bald eagle. Let's look at the branch I, I have here. Here is, uh, here. So you, you get a, a tree coming. Lamprey doesn't have any of those, so you branch out. And then you put here jaw. So the jaw now becomes a derived character because it is in the all the members of the lineage here, but it is not there in the lamprey. So the jaw is a derived character. And then you now go and you see, because we dealt with, once we have jaws, then the next branch was the bus, because the bus didn't have the other thing, so it was go there. Then there the next branch here was development of lungs. After lungs, then you come to the antelope, because the antelope doesn't have a gizzard and uh, doesn't have feathers. So the antelope branches out. And then now you have a gizzard, and both of these members have a gizzard. So this would be a derived character for both of them, because both of them have. But it, it would not be uh, uh, for this. It would not be a derived character for this. That's how you construct phylogenetic trees. Concept 26.3, shared characters are used to construct phylogenetic trees. Homologous characters are used to infer phylogeny or relatedness. Cladistics refers to grouping organisms by common ancestry. So cladistics is the science of grouping. So what you are grouping, we call them clades from cladistics. So a clade is a group of species that includes an ancestor, ancestral species, and all its de descendants. There are three types of uh, uh, clades that we will discuss today. The monophyletic clade, which includes the ancestor and all its descendants. The paraphyletic clade, which is the ancestor plus some, not all, but some descendants. And the polyphyletic, which is taxa with many ancestors, many ancestors. Let's look at that. Here is a monophyletic clade. Here is an ancestor here, and gave to two lineages, 
But we are not going to deal with that. We are going to look at this ancestor here at one. This ancestor produced a lineage which has A and then, then C and B. C and B are sister taxa, but all of them, they share a recent common ancestor here. So this is a monophyletic group. Now, in this case here, you have this group here. Uh, here is the, uh, you have this, so we take this ancestor here, uh, and it diverged and gave rise to D and E, but it gave rise to uh, also to E, F, and G. You notice in our grouping, we have not included G. If I had to extend this so that I include G, this would become monophyletic. But because now I am only including some, not all members, this becomes paraphyletic. I take you back here. Paraphyletic ancestor plus some descendants. So here, ancestor here, and with the some, not all descendants. Now when you come to polyphyletic, you know, you see here, you have... Uh, this group here, an ancestor there, and another ancestor here. So some of this, this is here. So this group here, this would become like a polyphyletic group. But when you are looking at the whole thing, this is actually polyphyletic. This could be para if you are to, to no, no, this is not even para because this does not come from here. This comes from a different ancestor. So this is a polyphyletic and different ancestry for these groups. And so, Questions can come. If you removed G, if you included G uh, in this part here, what would they make this? Then you would say that would be monophyletic. And uh, here I would say, if you included um, uh, D for here, what would that make it? Uh, that would make it polyphyletic, uh, poly polyphyletic, because you would have to have another ancestor here and an ancestor here. So you can see, by deciding whom you include and who you eliminate, you decide whether the group is monophyletic, polyphyletic, or paraphyletic. Shared ancestral characters and derived character. A shared ancestral character is a character that originated in an ancestor of a taxon, while a shared derived character is an evolutionary novelty unique to a particular group. Now let's talk about some terminologies here. The terminology, something you call maximum parsimony. The, 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 the agreement among evolutionary biologists is that when we are constructing an evolutionary tree, we should make a tree, if you make several trees to represent relationships, uh, you are working with certain organisms, and you construct, you make a tree there, that's a possibility. And this other tree is also a possibility. And this other tree is a possibility. What they will tell you is pick the tree which has the fewest branches. The tree with the fewest branches is the most parsimonious. So in other words, we are using the law of maximum parsimony. The tree that has the fewest evolutionary events is the tree that is most likely to be accepted by evolutionary biologists. You can always make a tree that's more complex, but the simpler the tree, the, the better it is. So when you have a, and so they use computer computers to generate these trees, and then they pick up the, the best tree based on the one that it seems to be the simplest. Now, when you make these trees, you can decide also on another naming, and now we talk about out group and in group. An out group is a species that is more distantly related to the species of interest than to the other members. Because the, the members, the ones that are closely related are called the in group. You know what you talk about, somebody who is in the inner, inner circle. Uh, okay, so you have a special deal with them. But an out group is a, a not as related. And so here I ask you, here, here is the question, which species would be the best candidate to serve as an out group for a clade whose ancestor occurs at the position to common ancestor 
occurs at position two. So th if this position two is the common ancestor of B as well as C and D, then this common ancestor is not, uh, does not apply to A. So A di diverged earlier than this common ancestor. So A is the outgroup. Okay? So if, that is the, if that's where the common ancestor is, then you have to look at an outgroup species most, uh, that best uh, can, uh, you know, that it diverged earlier and, uh, uh, than the common ancestor of the inner group. These are the inner group. Okay? If you are dealing with here, if you talk about, um, talking about uh, if I say the ancestor, if I use three and I say, I ask you which would be the outer group if the ancestor, if three is the common ancestor of this group, then you would have to say, then this here is the outer group. You have to take E as, um, or, or you have to take this, uh, and because E e would be coming from here, diverged from here. That's how you determine outer group and the inner group. Concept 26.4. An organism's evolutionary history is documented in its genome. It is the genes, folks. Genes are what contain the story of an organism's uh, journey. And there are, genes can are found in two places. You have genes, you have uh, DNA that is in the nucleus, but you also have DNA that is in the mitochondria. Now, the, the, if you take the DNA, the DNA that codes for the ribosomal RNA, when you look at how it changes, the DNA that codes for ribosomal RNA, that DNA is very stable. It doesn't change much. It, is, it can be stable for a long time. And so it changes very slowly. So we only use that DNA when we are investigating uh, organisms that have a long history. And uh, so, they, it changes very slowly. But if you are dealing with organisms that diverged recently, then you don't have enough uh, mutation events, changes, to really give you confidence in what you are investigating. So you don't use the ribosomal RNA. You use mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondrial DNA is used to, uh, to investigate recent branching points because it evolves very rapidly. In fact, if you look at the human studies on, on human evolution, they use mitochondrial DNA to talk about Eve and Adam. Mitochondrial DNA because it's assumed that the ancestor, the, the, the divergence is only probably about a, a million years or less uh, since we shared a common ancestor. So you use mitochondrial DNA. Now we know genes can actually duplicate. Genes, we talked about this when you are dealing uh, uh, before. We talked about the duplication of genes or genes can be, uh, they, they can actually be, be eliminated from the genome. Okay, so you can uh, remove genes or you can duplicate genes. And um, so let's look at here. Now, the concept 26.5, molecular clock helps to track evolutionary time. The assumption about how the molecular clock works, a molecular clock uses constant rates of evolution in some genes to estimate the absolute time of evolutionary change. So there are two types of genes evolutionary biologists look at. There is what you call orthologous genes. These are genes, nucleotides, which, are, where, which have been substituted. Nucleotide substitutions are proportional to the time since they last shared a common ancestor. So in other words, the organisms you are looking at, have their genome shows evidence of nucleotide substitution, not deletion now, substitution. Uh, yeah substitutions where one nucleotide has been substituted for another. And then you, so if you look at the orthologous genes, will help you, the, the, you study them to figure out using those substitution to figure out, because we know, we, we biologists as estimate 
what is the rate? How frequently do these substitutions take place? Now, this is again, it is something that uh, they have to, or oh, there is some experimentation that is done, but you cannot be completely sure about how frequently things change because it's, uh, you know, we never know. A UV radiation is not necessarily constant. There are sometimes the sun can release more UV spots, more of UV radiation, and that could speed up um, substitutions or, or, or mutations. So this is again a hypothesis. So you use, when you are dealing with the nucleotide substitutions, you work with orthologous genes. When you are dealing with paralogous genes, nucleotide substitution are proportional to the time since the gene became duplicated. So here now you see we are adding, it's not just substitution. We are saying, okay, there was a, a, a duplication of the gene that happened. And after the duplication, we started having gene substitutions. So we are asking, how long since the duplication? So if you look at that kind of genome, which is showing that we, we, we work with, uh, we talk about working with the paralogous genes. So the molecular clocks are calibrated against the branches whose dates are known from fossil record. And how do we know the dates from fossil record? Well, by doing radiocarbon dating. And again, radiocarbon dating has its own assumptions that we make. And so you see throughout the whole of this, there's a lot of assumptions that have to hold true for these things to happen. But again, that is the path evolutionary biologists choose to travel on. A simple tree of life, a tree of life is based largely on RNA genes. A tree of life suggests that eukaryotes and archaea are more closely related to each other than to bacteria. And uh, in fact, if you look at uh, the simple tree of life, so here is where they tell you the common ancestor was, and they say that this ancestor was a protist, a protestant. And that the protist uh, gave, out, uh, gave rise to the two branches. One branch produced a domain bacteria, the other branch, I've um, given an ancestor there, who branched into two. One branch produced archaea. The other branch became the branch that produced eukarya. So you see archaea and eukarya share a recent ancestor more. We are closer to, to fungi. Hey, you are closer to a fungi than you are to some bacteria in terms of uh, your ancestry, if you, if you are following this evolutionary tree. And um, well, folks, that is the end of our discussion on chapter 26 on phylogeny. I am sorry, I will not be able to be here on Wednesday morning and the Thursday morning because I have a medical appointment. Uh, Wednesday, I'll be uh, at home preparing for uh, that medical thing that will take place early on Thursday morning at 6.30. I will go for that medical appointment, after which I will come back and see you on Friday morning. Now, if I am feeling well, if I go through, I come out, uh, after I wake up from my, uh, my operation, if I wake up and I I have the strength on that city, I will come to the lab. I'll send you a, an email, but most likely don't count on that. Uh, if you have questions, um, you can, uh, I have covered most of the stuff here, or you can actually ask Professor Navia, since he is covering the same thing in the class. Feel free uh, to talk to Professor Navia, and if you want to attend his class at noon, uh, feel free to also do that. Thank you and God bless you and see you on Friday morning.